I'm happy to be back with you again as we continue our time together talking about technical writing. Particularly, I want to talk about the abstract. How can we prepare a good abstract that will capture the attention of our editor, of our reviewer, so he doesn't immediately throw our paper in the trash or immediately think we will waste his time, but rather is interested in learning more. We're going to talk about the purpose of the abstract today, and we're also going to talk about how we can modify our paper abstract to become a conference abstract, and what are some special things we need to be concerned about when we talk about conference abstract. You see the picture on our PowerPoint is taken from a computer game that my students love to play. <laughs> my students just love computer games. They do not love technical writing. <laughs> and I think that's a problem that we teachers often have, isn't it? That, uh, what we want to teach our students are not interested in, they're in, interested in something else. They love those online computer games. Warcraft. <laughs> Sangor. Yeah. They can play them for hours and hours. And as a technical writing teacher, I want to cheat a little bit. I'm going to try to connect technical writing, which they don't like, to telling their own story, like a computer game, which they do like. I'm going to compare storytelling to abstract writing today because I think, I think that this will help us better understand the process of writing the abstract. And it's certainly more interesting for my students. And this is, I think, something important to remember as researchers, that one of the most valuable things that we need is motivation. When our motivation to write dies, everything dies. And one habit of good researchers is that they're able to maintain their motivation. They're able to keep up their writing. And often, the way they do this is by creating a mental model, like a computer game, for example. And since they like their mental model, they don't think about writing. Writing is boring. Writing takes away your energy. But instead, they think about something else, killing a monster, making the world better, telling their own story. I'm going to share with you today the mental model that I give my students in the university, how writing is like storytelling, particularly like their favorite computer game. So why computer games? Why do my students like it so much? I, was, uh, I walked into a lab recently saw one of my PhD students, late at night, playing computer games. Now I know this guy needs to write papers. He needs to publish seven papers before he can graduate. That's a lot of papers, really. That's kind of crazy. But he's coming close to the seventh year of his PhD program. He doesn't have seven. He should be writing his paper. But what is he doing? Playing computer games. So I asked him. I said, why computer games? Why are computer games so interesting to you? And he said, well, teacher, when I play computer games, I can tell my own story. I walk around in my online world. He said, I also have clear motivation to play. You know, I enjoy it. I have no motivation for research, he says. But computer games, I have a feeling. I want to play. He said, I have a clear mission. I know what I need to do to kill the monster, to save the princess, <laughs> to do something. When in my research, I don't always know what I'm doing so clearly. Third, he said, I can try different ways to succeed. If the monster kills me this time, I'm coming back next time. I'll try something else. He said, four, I can quantify my success. He says, every time, I kill 10 monsters, I will level up. Da -da 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 -da, level two, da -da 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 -da, level three. And I'll feel warm in my heart, he said. It feels so good. He says, finally, I can make a difference in my online world. He says, when I walk around in my virtual world, I'm a big man. I have impact. People look at me and they say, wow, there's a level 53 dragon killer. And I feel so good. 
He says, I don't really feel that for my research. What I want to point out is that my student has just exactly given us the parts of an academic paper and the parts of an abstract. We call them different things, but they're all there. In our technical paper, instead of motivation, we call it background, don't we? That's the first sentences of our paper and the first part of our abstract. And I want to tell you that the abstract is a good place to start because the abstract is a mini paper, isn't it? All the parts of the paper are in the abstract. It's only smaller. So if we can understand the structure of the abstract, we can also better understand the structure of the full paper, can't we? So right in the beginning, motivation, background, that's what we start with. Why this problem? Why are we studying it? I'm going to get into more detail about each of these. Sentence two, we call our objective. He called it a mission, what we want to do. Third sentence of the abstract, third part of the paper, third thing my student said was he wants to quantify, uh, try different ways to succeed. We call that our methods, don't we? He says he wants to quantify his success. We call that our results. He says he wants to have an impact on his online world. We call that implications or applications, don't we? How our research can connect to the larger group of researchers in our domain. I'm going to go through each of these and compare them to storytelling a little bit with you today. And again, the abstract is exactly the same as the paper. All the same parts are there. Or we can use a simpler abstract structure. Why this study? Motivation. What did you investigate? Problem statement. What did you do? Method. What did you find out? Results. What do your results mean? Implications. So what? Applications. Those are both in the discussion. Let's take this example of storytelling and research writing a little step further. I want to compare researchers in the lab to heroes in the story. I think if we spend this time comparing them, maybe we too can gain more motivation in our own writing. We can begin to see ourselves not only as someone who has to put words on paper, but as a hero in our own story that we are telling. First, heroes and researchers are both judged by their problems. I think this is an important point to mention. Students so oftentimes spend a lot of time emphasizing their beautiful solution. But until I first believe the problem is important, I will never care about the solution. There is nothing more worthless than a solution to a problem that I don't have. And same in the story. We judge the hero not by his solution, but by his monster, don't we? If he kills a big monster, he's a big hero. If he kills a little monster, we just feel sorry for the monster. <laughs> Superman is only super because he has super enemies, right? If he has no super enemies, he's just a strange man in strange clothes who flies around. We only care about Superman after we meet the bad guy, and it's the same in our paper, which is why right in the beginning, in the introduction, first job, define the problem well. Because if you introduce a big monster and you try to kill it, even if you die, you can still be a hero, right? Even if we fail in our research, if our problem was very interesting, very important, we might still be published. But if we have no problem and we die, well, no one's going to publish that. <laughs> our impact is determined by our problem. We can't miss this part, oftentimes, too. Researchers assume too much. They think everyone knows why this is a problem. Not necessarily true. We've got to begin right in the start.